The ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war has persisted for a long time, with Crimea being the focal issue. This peninsula is located to the south of Ukraine and north of the Black Sea. For the Russians, it's a vital passage to the Mediterranean world. Russia has always been ambitious about securing ports of access to the sea. Despite Russia's extensive coastline, there are actually very few good ports. Therefore, Crimea has become vital for Russia. Why does Russia need sea access? Of course, it's to compete for dominance in Europe and the world. In the first half of the 19th century, Russia had the potential to become the world's only superpower, like today's United States. At the beginning of the 19th century, Napoleon's French army ravaged Europe, but suffered a defeat in Russia. After that, Napoleon's fate took a sharp downturn. Russia was the decisive force that defeated Napoleon, and became one of the most important powers in the reconstruction of Europe after the war. Before the 19th century, they were seen as barbarians by Europeans, but after the Congress of Vienna, the Russians became the masters of Europe's fate. Thus began their westward expansion. However, Russia's ambitions alarmed and displeased the other great powers. At that time, Britain was laying out its global empire and certainly could not allow Russian influence in Europe. France, having revived after its defeat, could not tolerate Russia's arrogance either. Of course, it wasn't just Britain and France that wanted to resist Russia. For Russia to expand westward, they had to pass through Turkey's core territories, namely, the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits below Istanbul. The Russians thought it simple, since Turkey was declining and they wanted to expand westward, they might as well just conquer Turkey. How could Turkey agree to that? Hence, the once great Islamic empire joined hands with Britain and France at that time to resist Russia. Christians and Muslims could unite, and so could traditional enemies like Britain and France, which shows how much Russia's westward expansion was resented. This led to an inevitable conflict between Russia and the world's powers. The war broke out in 1853, initially as a conflict between Russia and Turkey. Russia thought it would only have to deal with Turkey, but ended up drawing intervention from Britain and France. Britain and France were straightforward, you want to get out through the Black Sea? We'll block your naval base in the Black Sea and completely destroy you. Thus, the Crimean War erupted. The war involved several major powers and was a prelude to later conflicts such as the Russo-Japanese War and World War I. Quick decisions became history in Crimea, what replaced them was a prolonged war of attrition. During this war, railways, telegraphs and steamships were used for the first time and played a significant role. Throughout the war, frontline war correspondents and nurses gradually became factors that influenced history. In such wars of attrition, the old aristocratic honors of soldiers were also exhausted. The Crimean War ended all previous forms of warfare and ushered in a new era of bloody slaughter for humanity. In Russia itself, the Crimean War is known as World War Zero. Its narration and study remain popular topics to this day. Of course, one of the most significant outcomes of this war was that it deepened the hostility between Russia and the West. This hostility continued through two world wars in the 20th century and the Cold War, all bearing the legacy of the Crimean War. Now let's talk about the Crimean War. Due to time constraints, I will divide it into two videos. This is the first video where I will detail every aspect of this war, so please subscribe to my channel. The war took place from 1853 to 1856 with direct participation from Russia, Turkey, Britain and France. At that time, Britain, France and Russia were among the world's most powerful countries. Their involvement in a three-year war indicates its intensity. Before this war, Russia was considered part of Europe's great powers. However, after these three years of war, Russia was completely ousted from Europe's circles. Western countries began to maintain a vigilant stance towards Russia. Nowadays when we mention Russia, we think of bears, images of polar bears that are fierce and can hurt people at any moment. This image existed before but was solidified by the Crimean War. Since then, the fierce bear has become an image of Russia that everyone fears. So this psychology deeply influenced subsequent historical developments. Whether it's the Russo-Japanese War or World Wars I and II that we talked about before, the Great Powers' caution towards Russia has always been an important factor in these historical events. Even during the later Cold War, which superficially seemed to be an ideological struggle between America and the Soviet Union, at its core reflected everyone's fear of Russia. 
Even now, many years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union with Putin emerging as a strong leader in Russia, the outside world is extremely cautious. This sentiment has persisted for over a hundred years, with its starting point being the Crimean War. After talking so much, some might ask where Crimea is located. This place is a peninsula situated on the northern side of the Black Sea, surrounded by the sea on three sides. If you are following the current war where Russia has invaded Ukraine, you should be quite familiar with this place. Before the 18th century, this area was occupied by the Mongols, and later the Ottoman Empire reached out and made it their territory. In the 18th century, as the Ottoman Empire's power waned, Russia took advantage of the situation. During the reign of Peter the Great, Russia first used a combination of soft and hard tactics to force Turkey to recognize Crimea's independence. By 1783, Russia simply sent troops to occupy the area and built the Sevastopol fortress there, taking control of Crimea. From then on, Russia had an outlet to the Black Sea. The Russian national desire for land and seaports is endless. With the acquisition of Crimea, Russia's expansionist influence reached the Black Sea. But that wasn't enough. The Black Sea, large as it is, is after all an inland sea surrounded by areas either already penetrated by Russian influence or inhabited by undeveloped nomadic tribes. Russia wanted to expand further from the Black Sea to more distant places. To the west of the Black Sea lies the Mediterranean Sea, a region of ancient civilization. In the 19th century, this region was a crossroads of international powers, bustling ports, and thriving trade. The Russians were envious and wanted at all costs to gain a foothold in the Mediterranean. The only passage from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean is through the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles Straits. These two straits are adjacent to each other, with the Ottoman capital of Istanbul located at the entrance of the Bosphorus Strait. Any Russian power, be it merchant ships or warships, wishing to enter the Mediterranean from the Black Sea, must pass under the watchful eye of the Turks. If Turkey were hostile to Russia, then no matter how many warships Russia had in the Black Sea, they would be useless, unable to go anywhere. In the first half of the 19th century, Russia's industry and commerce developed rapidly. From 1825 to 1845, imports of various machinery and equipment increased by 30 times. The number of factories engaged in manufacturing doubled. These factories needed raw materials from the Mediterranean world and also needed to sell their products there for profit. All these materials and products had to pass through those two straits controlled by Turkey. So, it was extremely frustrating for Russia. Initially, if Russia had good relations with Turkey, things might have been negotiable. But not only did Russia not want to coexist peacefully with Turkey, it even wanted to annihilate Turkey altogether. This complicated matters significantly. Historically, Turkey was a great power too, for Russia to annihilate it would require considerable strength. Fortunately for Russia, it was at a time of rising national strength in the first half of the 19th century. It even considered itself as Europe's gendarme at one point, interfering in European affairs as a matter of routine. This situation dates back to 1815 when Napoleon was completely defeated at Waterloo. Several major European powers met in Vienna, Austria's capital, in an attempt to establish a new order in post-war Europe. It was agreed that five major powers would maintain peace in Europe, Britain, France, Prussia, Austria-Hungary, and Russia. However, among these five powers, France was essentially neutralized, Prussia and Austria were severely weakened, and Britain had little interest in continental Europe. For a time, Russia was the most powerful nation in Europe. During the previous Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon had been undefeated across Europe. However, his campaign came to an abrupt end after his disastrous invasion of Russia in 1812. This gave the Russian Tsar a great sense of moral superiority. In the 1840s, Tsar Nicholas I felt that if not for Russia, Europe would still be trembling under Napoleon's threat. Having played such a pivotal role in Europe's defense, why shouldn't Russia interfere in European affairs? Thus Nicholas I actively meddled in foreign and domestic policies across Europe, earning Russia the nickname Gendarme of Europe. In 1848, when internal turmoil struck the Austrian Empire, and its new emperor Franz Joseph could not control the Hungarians who rebelled and declared they did not recognize the Habsburg dynasty, while defeating regular armies battle after battle. Desperate, Emperor Joseph went to Warsaw to meet Tsar Nicholas I and asked for Russian help in dealing with Hungary. 
Nicholas I sent 100,000 Russian troops to quell the Hungarian rebellion. Militarily speaking, Hungarian insurgents stood no chance against Russian regular forces. By August 1849, the rebellion was suppressed, and Russian commanders wrote to Tsar Nicholas I claiming that Hungary lay at his feet. In fact, not only Hungary but the entire Austro-Hungarian Empire and Central Europe trembled before Russian influence. At this point, Russia became de facto ruler of Europe. Russia was throwing its weight around on the European continent with great bravado. One country could not sit idly by, Britain, which possessed the most colonies worldwide at that time. The London Times wrote, if Russian boots have stepped into Vienna today, their next step will be Paris and then London. Suddenly all of Britain was afflicted with a fear of Russia. Tsar Nicholas I knew that Britain would not stand by ID while he expanded his power, hence he decided to visit Britain personally to show goodwill and inform them of his next targets while inviting Britain to join his plans. Tsar Nicholas I met with British Prime Minister Sir Robert Peel in London. During the meeting, the Tsar got straight to the point, stating that Russia must take control of the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits, as they were vital to Russia's southern region. At the time, these straits were under Turkish control, but the Tsar considered this a minor issue. His purpose in London was to discuss with Sir Robert Peel how to dismantle Turkey. The Ottoman Empire was experiencing frequent national uprisings internally, and to the Tsar, it seemed like a sick man of Europe on the verge of collapse. If Turkey were to fall, the Tsar insisted that Istanbul and the Straits, as well as their entrances, must belong to Russia. As for the rest of the empire, Russia and Britain could divide it between themselves. While the Tsar spoke fervently by the windowsill, Sir Robert Peel suggested they walk around the room as such significant matters should not be overheard by others. After shaking hands with Sir Robert Peel, both parties expressed their amicability. Sir Robert Peel verbally acknowledged the Tsar's plan but left no written record. The Tsar returned from London very satisfied, having received Britain's verbal assurance. The Tsar, a hearty and sincere man, genuinely believed in Sir Robert Peel's words, trusting that Russia and Britain would act together to divide the land of the sick man of Europe and establish a new order. Back in St. Petersburg, Nicholas I studied maps daily, contemplating how to dismantle the Ottoman Empire. He called over the British ambassador to hear about his grand plans. According to the Tsar's plan, Britain would acquire Egypt, Greece and Crete, while Russia would take the Balkans. Of course, Istanbul and the Dardanelles Strait had to be Russian. The Tsar spoke with enthusiasm, but the British ambassador dared not respond. Eventually, Nicholas I realized he had said too much and asked for the ambassador's opinion. The ambassador was so frightened that he fell on the spot, which the Tsar found amusing as he helped him up. In Nicholas I's view, his plan to dismantle Turkey had maximally considered Britain's interests. However, Britain did not agree, as strengthening Russia was a formidable enemy. British politicians decided at all costs to block Russia in the Black Sea. For this purpose, they incited ethnic minorities in the Caucasus within Russian territory to rebel and secretly provided increasing support to Turkey. By then, Turkey had long lost its ancestral glory. In the first half of the 19th century, national uprisings continued within Turkey, and the corrupt sultan needed huge funds to maintain his extravagant lifestyle. Where could Turkey find so much money? They turned to London bankers for loans and became addicted to borrowing. Over time, Turkey owed more and more money to Britain, becoming economically enslaved to Britain and politically manipulated step by step. Starting in 1842, Charles Stratford Canning served as the British ambassador to Turkey. Canning had a significant influence in Turkey, any Turkish official who displeased Canning faced dismissal. Apart from the Sultan, most Turkish officials did not even dare look Canning in the eye for fear that this great ambassador would trouble them. Canning himself had no fondness for Russians or Nicholas I, in his view, there could only be one master of the world, Britain. Anyone who dared challenge Britain's authority was met with Canning's utmost opposition. In 1850, when Turkey wanted to appoint someone with good relations with Tsar Nicholas I as the new ambassador to Russia, Canning immediately objected. Turkey had no choice but to appoint someone with no connections in Russia as the new ambassador. Canning's influence in Turkey and his determination to defend British global hegemony are evident from this. With British backing, Turkey had the confidence to confront Russia. To the Sultan, the British were insatiable but only interested in making money, this was nothing compared to what Russians wanted, land and lives. 
Choosing the lesser of two evils, Turkey decided to fight Russia at all costs. By 1852, with British support, Turkey, the sick man of Europe in the Tsar's eyes, not only did not collapse, but took an increasingly tough stance against Russia. Tsar Nicholas I also realized that his plan to divide Turkey with Britain was temporarily unfeasible. That was okay, as long as he did not openly fall out with Britain, there was still room for maneuver. In short, Russia wanted to divide Ottoman Turkey with Britain at that time. They aimed to control the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits and secure passage from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. However, Britain was already wary of Russian expansion. Upon hearing this plan, they were even more alarmed and determined to prevent Russia from occupying these straits at all costs. As a result, with British Ambassador Tanning's hard stance against Russia, a standoff between Britain, Turkey and Russia formed. This confrontation was not originally enough to provoke a war, but the emergence of the French Emperor greatly accelerated the process of war. The name of this Emperor was Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, commonly known as Napoleon III. Napoleon III was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, and the Bonaparte family had its ups and downs after Napoleon was deposed. Eventually, he was the only sole survivor left in politics from the Bonaparte family. Meanwhile, the Bourbon dynasty regained control over France. However, after experiencing the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era, even Louis XVI had been beheaded. With such a bloody lesson in front of them, the ruling methods of the Bourbon dynasty did not improve much. They suppressed public speech and levied heavy taxes on the people. The French populace, suffering under these conditions, reminisced about Emperor Napoleon and longed for his descendants' return. Finally, the July Revolution erupted in 1830 and the Bourbon dynasty was completely overthrown. A distant relative of the Bourbons, the Duke of Orleans, was elected king, establishing the Orleans dynasty. France became a constitutional monarchy. But that was not the end. By 1848, a wave of revolution swept across Europe and the Parisians, upholding their tradition of taking to the streets, initiated the February Revolution, which overthrew the Orleans dynasty. Thus, France once again became a republic, known as the Second Republic. Amid popular anticipation, Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte became president of the republic and three years later staged a coup to declare himself emperor. From then on, he was known as Napoleon III, and France entered the era of the Second Empire. Speaking of becoming an emperor in Europe, it wasn't something anyone could just decide to do. Traditionally, it meant you were nominally inheriting the throne of the Roman Empire and also had to be a protector of the Church. The Emperor of Austria inherited the throne of Western Rome up to the Holy Roman Empire and was also a protector of Catholicism. The Russian Tsar inherited the throne of Eastern Rome up to the Byzantine Empire and was also a protector of Eastern Orthodoxy. It was these relationships that gave Austria and Russia their imperial status. Of course, compared to these emperors, Napoleon was much more formidable. While others sought coronation from the Pope, he coerced the Pope from Rome to Paris to preside over his coronation ceremony. Then, without waiting for the elderly Pope to speak further, he crowned himself by taking the crown and placing it on his own head. That was his moment at the pinnacle of the world. The ambition of Napoleon III. He intended to emulate his great uncle Napoleon I, but lacked his uncle's capabilities and influence. The Russian Tsar did not recognize his imperial status, because Russia saw itself as Europe's gendarme with a responsibility to maintain European order, and did not wish for a new emperor to emerge in Europe. Moreover, given that the Bonaparte family had previously invaded Russia, there were deep-seated grievances between them. The Tsar used dismissive language in his letters to Napoleon III, but only addressed him as dear friend, not dear brother, clearly indicating that he did not regard Napoleon III as part of the emperor's club. This letter enraged Napoleon III because it meant that his imperial title was not recognized by Russia, making the conflict between France and Russia irreconcilable. French newspapers vehemently advocated for revenge for their defeat in 1812 against Russia. Only by thoroughly defeating Russia could they erase the shame of Napoleon's failed campaign. Since the Tsar did not acknowledge his imperial status, Napoleon III sought support from the Catholic Church instead. Despite heavy pressures during the Great Revolution and Napoleonic rule, the Church remained an important force within France that could not be ignored. Unlike Napoleon I's imperious attitude towards the Pope, Napoleon III went to great lengths to please the Church. He ordered the repair of churches within France and generously compensated clergy members, 
bringing a good time for the Catholic Church in France overnight. Naturally, many clergy praise Napoleon III's great achievements. However, despite domestic clergy support, the Pope did not make a statement which greatly troubled Napoleon III. He was determined to gain recognition from the Pope and even demanded a personal coronation by him. In an effort to please the Pope, Napoleon III even sent troops to help suppress the Roman Republic. Although we do not delve into these historical events in detail today, it is evident that the Pope held a very high status in Napoleon III's esteem. Nevertheless, even so, the Pope still did not provide Napoleon III with the response he hoped for. Next is the issue of Jerusalem, a huge conundrum in history. Jerusalem is known as a holy place for three religions, Jews consider it their ancient capital. Christians believe it is where Jesus was martyred and resurrected. Muslims believe it is from here that Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven on a sacred stone back to Mecca. For thousands of years, Jews, Romans, Arabs, Turks, and other peoples have fought over it incessantly without a definitive answer. To this day, the Jerusalem issue remains at the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Neither side is willing to compromise in mediations or negotiations. As a result, every so often, issues surrounding Jerusalem lead to armed conflicts between Palestinians and Israelis. Hamas is a different case altogether and will not be discussed here. In the 19th century, Jerusalem was part of the Ottoman Turkish territory. Ideally, it should have been an atmosphere of pure Islam. However, after many years of turmoil, Turkey's national power was no longer what it used to be. In the 18th century, the Russian Tsar managed to bribe the Turks into allowing Orthodox Christians to make pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Within Christianity, the Orthodox and Catholic churches have been at odds since the day the Roman Empire split. The Turks allowed Orthodox Christians to worship in the Holy City, and although Catholics ended this, they were powerless to change it due to Western Europe's distance from Turkey. These countries were too preoccupied with their own concerns during the Napoleonic Wars. In 1852, Napoleon III hoped to pressure Turkey to allow only Catholics to pilgrimage to the Holy Land of Jerusalem. If this were to happen, it would reconnect a nearly thousand-year severed tie between Catholics and Jerusalem since the time of the Crusades. For himself, this would be a remarkable achievement in the eyes of the Pope, something even Napoleon had not managed. Turkey quickly agreed to Napoleon III's request. But allowing Catholics to pilgrimage to Jerusalem was tantamount to slapping the face of the Russian Tsar and the Orthodox Church. In matters of religion, heretics are always treated more cruelly than followers of other faiths. Turkey being Muslim could still negotiate with France and Russia, however, French Catholics and Russian Orthodox Christians, both believers in God, could hardly stand each other. Especially for Tsar Nicholas I, he was even contemplating crushing France. Suppressing his rage, he sent his deputy, Prince Menshikov, to Istanbul. He demanded that Prince Menshikov reclaim all rights for Orthodox Christians within Ottoman Turkey and restore their ability to pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Naturally, the Tsar also demanded the establishment of an Orthodox holy land protected by Russia around Jerusalem, forever out of Catholic reach. For Turkey, discussing the restoration of Orthodox pilgrimages was one thing but protecting Jerusalem under Russian control was non-negotiable. Not to mention the Catholic stance, Jerusalem was also a holy place for Islam. If the Tsar cordoned off Jerusalem, would Turks themselves not be able to pilgrimage there? Hence Turkey could not accept this condition. Nicholas I was accustomed to acting as Europe's policeman and believed he was invincible, which was a miscalculation. Coincidentally, his envoy Prince Menshikov was highly trusted by the Tsar but was arrogant and hot-tempered. Arriving in Istanbul by boat, he demanded that the Turkish Sultan greet him at the dock before he even disembarked, which was excessive. However, compared to what followed, this demand was nothing. Menshikov arrived at the dock without seeing the Sultan and was furious. According to diplomatic protocol, envoys should wear full dress when visiting the Sultan in his palace but Prince Menshikov went directly there in casual clothes. He brazenly changed into his formal attire in front of the guards and when he finally met the Sultan in person, he refused even to bow and bluntly handed over the Tsar's letter. This showed utter disrespect for the Turkish Sultan. Now that Menshikov had seen the Sultan without even basic courtesy, it was clear he had no regard for Turkey. Despite its weakness, the Sultan had dignity. The Russian envoy openly defecating on his head was not there to negotiate, but to provoke a fight. The Sultan immediately expelled Menshikov. 
behind this bold move was support from the British ambassador to Turkey, Stratford Canning. Canning was well aware of Menshikov's arrival and issued several clear instructions to the Sultan, do not agree to any Russian demands, cease all contact with Menshikov, and most importantly, do not fear Russia, the bear. After issuing these instructions, Canning still worried about the Sultan's confidence and added, Russia dares not wage war, if they do, Britain will not stand idly by. With such a promise from Britain, the Sultan had enough confidence to expel Menshikov. However, the envoy himself was stubborn and said, You expel me? All right then, I'll wait on my ship for you to regret it and let you witness the power of the great Russian Empire. Menshikov did not wait in vain, he wrote a lengthy letter on board his ship reiterating Russia's demands. In addition to establishing a protectorate in Jerusalem, he added another condition. All Christians within the Ottoman Empire should be protected by his benevolent majesty the Tsar. This was undoubtedly a challenge to the Sultan's authority. By the 19th century, the Turkish Sultan was no longer seen as a butcher of Christians. Although his empire was weakened, it still had 18 million Christians living within its borders, especially on the Balkan Peninsula. The Sultan saw himself as their protector, but now Menshikov claimed only the Tsar could protect them which was a great insult to His Majesty the Sultan. Menshikov waited on board for three days, but the Sultan of Sudan was reluctant to meet, and Turkey did not send any envoys either. It seemed that Turkey had made up its mind to be an enemy of Russia. The arrogant Menshikov prepared to return home, but he felt that he could not return empty-handed. Before leaving, he decided to teach the Sultan a lesson. He ordered the closure of the Russian embassy in Turkey and returned to Russia with all the diplomatic staff and documents. Under normal circumstances, even if relations between two countries were tense, the embassy could never be closed. Menshikov's order was undoubtedly treating Turkey as an enemy state. Menshikov returned to St. Petersburg empty-handed, but the Tsar did not express dissatisfaction with him. After all, the Tsar had long wanted to wage war against Turkey. Since diplomatic means could not solve the problem, they had to resort to military force. This act first, talk later approach is typical Russian thinking. Moreover, in the eyes of Tsar Nicholas I, even if war broke out, it would only be the powerful Russia against the weakened Turkey. After all, they had fought so many years of war, victory was inevitable. Moreover, Britain had already assured that it would not be an enemy of Russia and Napoleon III of France was considered by the Tsar as nothing more than a nouveau wish, certainly not daring enough to stand behind Turkey against Russia. The Tsar's ministers, including Foreign Minister Karl Nesselrode, did not raise any objections. Nesselrode had been Foreign Minister since 1816 and was about to retire in 1852. At his age, he preferred to spend time gardening rather than dealing with Russian foreign affairs. Since even the foreign minister remained silent, any decision made by the Tsar would not be opposed. On July 3, 1853, the Tsar ordered 80,000 Russian troops to advance towards the Danube River, targeting the Turkish vassal states of Wallachia and Moldavia, which are today's Romania and Moldova. The Tsar claimed that Russia had to use force to protect the Orthodox Christians there. In fact, the Russian military's march was quite hasty and Tsar Nicholas I was more interested in intimidating Turkey with this move. His logic was simple, you refuse to talk to us. Then I will send my troops to your territory. Are you scared now? As long as you agree to Russia's protection rights over the Orthodox Christians in the Balkans, we will withdraw our troops. The Tsar wrote a letter to the Sultan of Turkey expressing this intention. After seeing the Tsar's letter, the British ambassador Tannings firmly advocated that the Sultan reject it. Tannings made it clear that Britain could not stand idly by, and with Russian troops entering the Balkans close to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the empire would not remain indifferent. Therefore, although the Tsar's troops looked formidable, they were actually stuck in the quagmire of the Balkans. In the larger European context, all of Europe might unite against Russia. After this analysis of the situation, the Sultan firmly decided to reject the Tsar's request. As Russian troops advanced deeper into the Balkans, Turkey officially declared war on Russia on September 22. Tsar Nicholas I thought Turkey had gone mad, he could not understand why such a weak country dared to challenge Russia. He confidently believed that within a month at most, Russian forces could move southward from the Balkans and approach Istanbul, at which point Turkey would undoubtedly surrender. But reality dealt a heavy blow to the Tsar. 
the Austro-Hungarian ambassador to Russia urgently requested an audience with Nicholas I and sternly warned him. Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary expressed serious concern about Russian actions in the Balkans. If Russia dared continue moving southward, Austria-Hungary would attack Russia's supply lines and intervene in Russia's actions together with Britain and France. Nicholas I trembled with rage on the spot, he angrily recalled past events, if it were not for Russia's help, Franz Joseph could never have become Emperor of Austria-Hungary, a few years ago in Warsaw, this guy was dependent on Russia, but now he turned against it. The Tsar felt this behavior was extremely shameless and angrily smashed several cuts in the row. Although Franz Joseph only made verbal threats without any actual action, the Tsar was still uneasy inside. He worried that if Austria-Hungary really sent troops, then the 80,000 Russian troops on the Balkan Peninsula might be completely annihilated. Therefore, the Tsar urged Russian forces to move southward as quickly as possible, once they crossed the Carpathian Mountains, they would be relatively safe. On the Balkan Peninsula, although the Turkish army was weak in combat strength, Russian forces won several battles. However, Russia's greatest enemy was not the Turks, but the adverse weather and complex terrain. There were few roads around the Carpathian Mountains, mostly dirt roads that turned into muddy pits when it rained. Even modern mechanized armies would struggle with such conditions, let alone the Russian army at that time which transported heavy artillery by manpower and horsepower. The autumn in the Balkans was cold and rainy, before muddy pits on the ground had time to dry up, new rain came again. In such harsh conditions, Russians slowly marched southward while Tsar remained unaware of the miserable conditions at the front line. He just felt that his army was moving too slowly and kept urging his generals to speed up their march. The Russian officers and soldiers tried every possible solution, but nobody can control the weather when it decides to rain. The Russian army's horses began dying in large numbers, and in their desperation, they conscripted the livestock of the local populace, but the locals had already fled. With no other choice, the soldiers were forced to take on the role of beasts of burden, carrying heavy loads and pulling carts. When they encountered impassable mud and water holes, the Russian officers would brutally select a few soldiers at random and force them to lie in the mud so that the carts could roll over their bodies. Even with such extreme measures, the Russian army still could not march quickly, and it became clear they would not be able to cross the Caucasus Mountains before the winter was over. The Russian commander ordered the troops to encamp on the spot and prepare for winter. The Tsar's plan for a swift victory was thus thoroughly mired in mud. Meanwhile, Turkey was not idle, they launched proactive strikes in the Caucasus and Georgia. The Russian defenses in these areas were very weak. Initially, Turkey attacked Russian border outposts with forces of a few thousand, then gradually sent larger forces to invade Georgia. Tsar Nicholas I hastily sent troops to Georgia to confront the Turkish forces. The Turkish army was capable of bullying outposts, but completely collapsed when facing regular Russian forces and hurriedly retreated back to their own country. However, such border raids brought endless fear to Russia. The main force of the Turkish army in combat was called the Basha Bazouk, which means leader in a state of anarchy. They were Turkish mercenaries known for their brutal routine, lack of organization and discipline, and ruthlessness in killing. In a Georgian town that was attacked, they nailed all captured Russian officials to crosses and beheaded captured priests one by one, as well as torturing pregnant women in the town to death. Such cruel acts made everyone in the Russian Caucasus region fear for their safety, not knowing when the Basha Bazouk would return like a whirlwind. Local residents fled their homes en masse, leaving vast tracts of land deserted. Although the Turkish military was not performing well, Western newspapers exaggerated their achievements with sensational reporting. The editorial in France's Le Figaro claimed that the Turkish military's training and combat capabilities were top-notch, that they had achieved consecutive victories on the Russian border and had captured many fortresses. Russia trembled in fear as such reports dominated Western public opinion at the time. Both British and French high-level officials and the public cheered for Turkey's so-called victories. Whether or not they were truly victorious in battle, the Turkish army instilled fear in Russians and was a source of encouragement for Britain and France, that was enough. In October 1853, the Sultan decided to continue sending troops by sea to the Caucasus region to create more trouble for the Russians. This was intolerable for Russia who had managed Crimea for years to control the Black Sea. Now that enemy troop transports could freely traverse the Black Sea, it was unbearable. What was the Russian Empire's fleet in Crimea doing? 
Shouldn't they take the initiative to attack and feed the Turks to the sharks? They actually couldn't take the initiative to attack. In the Russian military system, the Tsar had supreme authority, and the navy could not engage in active combat without his majesty's orders. Admiral Nakamov, commander of the Russian Black Sea fleet, wrote several letters to the Tsar requesting deployment of the fleet. The Tsar initially did not agree, but seeing the situation in the Caucasus deteriorate day by day, he finally approved fleet action in early November. If the Russian fleet could have engaged earlier, they could have blocked the Turkish troop ships at Istanbul's port. Now that opportunity was lost. However, Nakimov did not give up. Compared to the Turkish Navy, he had a secret high-tech weapon, the steam-powered warship Pizurev. At that time, almost all warships were powered by sails. Steamships were much faster than sailing ships, but steam technology was not mature at that time. The Pizurev had few weapons and could only be used for reconnaissance. Nakimov needed intelligence. He sent out the Pizurev, and within a few days, he returned with the latest news of the Turkish fleet. The entire Turkish fleet had completed its assembly at Sinop Bay. Not only did this location have all of Turkey's main naval vessels, but it was also protected by batteries from the Aegean Sea, a very difficult target to tackle. Nakimov faced a difficult choice if he directly attacked the Turkish fleet at Sinop. Their firepower was so fierce that victory was uncertain. If he waited for the Turkish fleet to leave port, it would be very difficult to determine their position at sea. If he waited until after the Turkish fleet had escorted their army to the Caucasus, it would be too late for any action. After consideration, Nakimov decided to block off the Turkish fleet at Sinop. The Russian Black Sea fleet was trained by him, they were high-spirited and strong in combat capability. With such soldiers and a bit of luck, victory was still within reach. On November 11th, Nakimov took the three fastest battleships of the Black Sea fleet to Sinop. Upon arrival, he did not rush to attack because these ships, despite their speed, lacked firepower, with only 84 cannons on each battleship. It was difficult for these ships to confront the seven Turkish battleships in Sinop, not to mention the support of the Turkish coastal batteries. Nakimov was patient, he ordered his battleships to anchor off the coast of Sinop, out of range of the Turkish guns, and simply blockaded them. Any Turkish battleship daring to break out of the port would be met with a fierce counterattack from the Russian navy. The Turks saw the Russian naval ships looming on the distant horizon but lacked the courage to sail out to meet the enemy, nor did they dare to scout the Russian military deployment. The high alertness and extreme excitement of the Turkish sailors at the beginning could not withstand days of such wearing down. Eventually, the sailors were so exhausted they could fall asleep standing up and the defense of the port's warships greatly weakened. Meanwhile, Nakamov was waiting for reinforcements. On November 17, several slower Russian battleships joined him. These ships moved clumsily but had 120 cannons each. These were Nakamov's main forces. Once these battleships were assembled, the Turks had been tormented to a state beyond recognition. Nakamov ordered all warships to fly the British flag and started to move into the inner harbor. At that time, a thick fog covered the sea. The Turks initially tensed up seeing ships entering the harbor, but relaxed when they saw the British flags. Unexpectedly, as the ships got closer, they quickly lowered the British flags and hoisted the Russian naval flag of St. Andrew. At the same time, the cannons began to fire furiously, catching the Turks completely off guard. The Russian navy used a secret weapon this time, explosive spherical shells. In the past, most cannonballs were solid iron balls that would punch holes in ships without causing extensive damage. These explosive shells were different, they shattered upon impact, devastating their targets. With these shells, Nakamov decimated the Turkish fleet after several rounds of cannon fire. The Turkish coastal batteries could not retaliate against the Russian surprise attack, where the Russian explosive shells hit, thick smoke rose, obscuring their view. Thus, during the entire battle, the coastal batteries were essentially ineffective. After Nakamov's forces dealt with the Turkish warships and started targeting the batteries, they too were destroyed. By sunset, the Turkish fleet was no more. In this battle of Sinop, Russia achieved a complete victory. The Russian navy officers and sailors indulged in victorious celebrations when the fleet triumphantly returned to Sevastopol. All residents cheered for their returning heroes. The Tsar awarded Nakamov with the Order of St. George and established him as an exemplar for Russian soldiers. 
Even later, a prestigious Russian naval academy and a nuclear-powered cruiser were named after Nakamov. Faced with such honors, Nakamov remained silent. He knew that although the Turkish navy was thoroughly defeated, Britain and France would not stand idly by. The Russian navy won a victory in the Battle of Sinop but was thus drawn into a protracted bitter conflict. Nakamov's prediction was incredibly accurate. In London, Earl John Russell, leader of the Liberal Party and grandfather of the later famous philosopher Bertrand Russell, delivered a speech in the House of Commons that fervently stirred public emotion. Unlike his grandson who was an advocate for peace, Earl Russell declared in his speech, we need to pull out the teeth from under the bear's jaw. As long as Russian fleets and bases are intact in the Black Sea, Istanbul will not be safe, nor will there be any peace in Europe. The French Emperor Napoleon III could no longer sit idle and join Britain in issuing an ultimatum to the Tsar, demanding Russian troops withdraw from the Balkans and immediately start negotiations with Turkey. However, Tsar Nicholas I's attitude towards land followed traditional Russian practice, my land is mine, your land may also become mine, land I have occupied is mine forever. Asking Russians to withdraw was akin to killing Nicholas I, he certainly could not agree. Therefore, on February 9, 1854, Russia rejected the Anglo-French ultimatum and declared a break in diplomatic relations with them. Subsequently, in March, Britain and France declared war on Russia one after another. The war between Russia and Turkey eventually escalated into a world war among great powers. Seeing more European enemies against Russia did not worry Tsar Nicholas I too much. He believed that even if Britain and France became enemies, Austria-Hungary and Prussia might stand on his side. When Russia invaded the Balkans in 1853, Austria-Hungary was already unhappy and threatened to threaten Russian flanks. Yet the Tsar still believed Austria-Hungary might align with Russia. Of course, his judgment wasn't entirely delusional, after all, nominally Russia had a long-standing alliance with Austria-Hungary and Prussia, dating back to the Holy Alliance established at the Congress of Vienna in 1815 after Napoleon's defeat. After Napoleon's defeat, the major powers of Europe convened in Vienna to discuss the establishment of a post-war order in Europe. Due to the sanctions imposed on France as a result of Napoleon's defeat, it was impossible for it to preside over the justice of post-war Europe, just as Germany and Japan could not become permanent members of the United Nations after World War II. Since Britain was ambivalent about maintaining order on the European continent, the British could not have the final say in European affairs. This left only the Austrian Empire, Prussia, and Russia among the five great powers. Among these three, the Austrian Empire was the legitimate Habsburg dynasty, Prussia was an emerging state, and they did not get along with each other and could not help one another. Eventually, they turned to Russia in the east. After Napoleon, Russia's national prestige had reached its peak and it was eager to intervene in European affairs. Thus, the Holy Alliance was born. From 1815 to 1850, this alliance appeared to be unbreakable on the surface. The earlier mentioned intervention of Nicholas I in the internal affairs of the Austrian Empire also seemed to be a fulfillment of the obligations of the Holy Alliance, but in fact, both Austria and Prussia had long been dissatisfied with Russia's domineering style. In the mid-19th century, the outbreak of the Austro-Prussian War led to a series of disputes. Russia favored Austria, but Prussia had long harbored grievances and thus would not stand up for Russia in this conflict. As for the Austrian Empire, even though Tsar Nicholas I had helped Emperor Franz Joseph to power, considering that the Balkans were adjacent to the empire's heartland, Austria would not tolerate deep Russian involvement. By 1853, Franz Joseph threatened Tsar Nicholas I, claiming he would attack Russia's flank, a move driven by the sensitivity of geopolitical concerns. However, for Nicholas I, the Holy Alliance was a given. In his view, Austria should support Russia no matter what it did. The so-called threat to the flank was just Franz Joseph's temper tantrum, after all, they were brothers in the alliance. But when Russia was about to go to war with Britain and France, Members of the Holy Alliance had to set aside their internal differences and face the common enemy together. Unexpectedly, Austria decided to break with Russia. On April 20, 1854, Prussia and Austria declared neutrality and secretly formed a defensive alliance, signaling the collapse of the nearly 40-year-old Holy Alliance. Moreover, on June 3, Austria mobilized 80,000 troops and assembled them on the border between Hungary and the Balkans. Franz Joseph politely issued an ultimatum to the Russian Tsar, 
demanding that Russian troops immediately withdraw from Wallachia and Moldavia. Nicholas I felt insulted and angrily rejected this demand. A few days later, Austria signed a treaty with Turkey, which agreed to allow Austria to occupy these two principalities on the Balkan Peninsula until the end of the war. Thus, Russia was on a path to being at odds with the entire world. Among them, Britain and France were irreconcilable enemies, relations with Austria and Prussia were also poor, while Turkey was viewed by other European countries as a heretic. These countries were originally difficult to unite, but now came together against Russia. The Russian navy had already annihilated the Turkish fleet at the end of 1853, but Nicholas I withdrew command of the fleet after victory. From December 1853 to April 1854, nearly half a year, although the Russian Black Sea fleet had an advantage, it failed to act effectively, it neither bombarded Istanbul nor attacked the remaining Turkish forces near the Caucasus. Meanwhile, before declaring war on Russia, Britain and France had already completed troop movements through a large number of steamships. Shortly after declaring war, the British and French fleets broke into the Black Sea and bombarded the fortress of Sevastopol. This action sent a clear message, Britain and France were serious about fighting this war until Russia was subdued. At the same time, the British Royal Navy was striking on all fronts. At that time, it was already the most powerful maritime force in the world, just one of its squadrons was enough to destroy other countries' entire navies. The vast territory of the Russian Empire had a long coastline from the Baltic Sea to the Arctic Ocean and even to the Pacific Ocean, filled with targets vulnerable to attacks. The Royal Navy also adopted hit-and-run tactics that caused great distress for Russians. Several ports on the Kola Peninsula along the Arctic Ocean were bombarded by British warships, even Kamchatka Peninsula in the Pacific was not spared. A Royal Navy squadron attacked Petropavlovsk, Kamchatka's capital, although local Russian defenders repelled the British attack, coastal cities across Russia were no longer secure, resulting in psychological impacts immeasurable for Russians. Even the Russian capital of St. Petersburg was threatened by the Royal Navy. A detachment of the Royal Navy entered the Gulf of Finland through the Baltic Sea, effectively blocking St. Petersburg's access to the sea. This detachment was ordered to launch a surprise attack and occupy St. Petersburg if conditions allowed, if not, they were to continue the blockade of the Gulf of Finland. St. Petersburg, being a heavily fortified capital, had its port entrance controlled by the cannons of the Kronstadt Fortress which commanded the only waterway. A rash attack by this detachment of the Royal Navy would likely lead to their doom. After much consideration, the British fleet commander abandoned the idea of capturing the Russian capital and instead kept pressure on the Gulf of Finland. This alone was enough to terrify the Tsar, who ran daily from the eastern palace to the seaside to see if the British fleet had attacked. The Tsar ordered his entourage to prepare outerwear so they could flee quickly in case of a surprise attack while also commanding all Russian warships in the port of St. Petersburg to be ready for action. At that time, Russia's strongest fleet was in St. Petersburg, and now it was trapped in the capital to defend the Tsar, unable to assist elsewhere. By the summer of 1854, the Russian army was struggling, from the Black Sea to the Pacific and back to St. Petersburg, Russia faced crises everywhere. Their only offensive hold was in the Balkans. In the previous winter, an 80,000-strong Russian army attempted to cross the Carpathian Mountains from the Balkans but was stopped by bad weather and muddy terrain. In 1854, Tsar Nicholas I ordered them to advance. Marshal Paskovich reluctantly led his troops across the Danube River and after defeating the Turkish forces on the opposite bank, he immediately returned to St. Petersburg to urge Tsar Nicholas I to retreat. The Austro-Hungarian Empire had already shown hostility towards Russia, and they could stab Russia in the side at any moment. What would happen to these 80,000 Russian troops then? Despite Marshal Paskovich's pleas, the Tsar remained unmoved, thinking that Paskovich might be ill and thus so cautious. Regardless, the Tsar ordered him to advance quickly towards Istanbul. A disheartened Marshal Paskovich returned to the Balkans and continued to command the Russian advance. The greatest threat now facing Russian forces was not the Turkish field army, but a fortress named Silistra on a strategic crossroads along the Danube River that could not be bypassed. In fact, if Paskovich had advanced quickly at that time, perhaps he could have taken down the fortress easily. But as he himself was extremely cautious and unwilling to take risks, this gave the Turks time to fortify it. By the time Russia truly intended to attack the fortress, it had become a tough hedgehog to crack. 
The Tsar was unaware of the situation at the front and seeing that Paskovich could not take Silistra Fortress, he sent his most capable engineering expert, General Hild, to assist Paskovich. General Hild was already advanced in years but resolutely went to organize a siege in the Balkans upon receiving orders. During this period, an impatient Russian infantry officer used three battalions worth of troops to attack Silistra Fortress. The result was disastrous, the officer himself was hit by a bullet and in haste his deputy ordered a retreat. The unprepared battalions fell into disarray and suffered heavy losses from a Turkish counterattack from within the fortress. After this failed assault, the Turks became even more vigilant. General Hild, the engineering expert, had no choice but to readjust his deployment. Many Russian nobles and officers were anxious about the tense situation on the Balkan front and petitioned to serve their country there. Among them was Colonel Andrei Karamzin, a cavalry officer full of patriotic enthusiasm. Despite being just a colonel, he had deep connections in Russian high society. His father was a somewhat famous writer and historian. His own social circle included luminaries of society, Pushkin, Lermontov, Gogol, all prominent figures in Russian history and his good friends. Karamzin came to the Balkans purely for honor, even old Marshal Paskovich had to show him some respect. Karamzin arrived at the front with considerable power. He could command six squadrons of cavalry, 100 Cossacks, and four cannons. For a colonel, this was quite an extensive force. The soldiers were very dissatisfied with him, feeling he was just a spoiled nobleman. Karamzin knew this and was determined to do something to change their impression of him. Soon after, Marshal Paskovich ordered Karamzin to scout near Silistra Fortress. Karamzin saw thousands of Turkish reinforcements from afar. Normally, he should have hurried back with this intelligence. Tarantin was determined to prove himself. Despite his forces being vastly outnumbered by the Turks, he ordered his light cavalry to charge. The result was, of course, no surprise, the Russian reconnaissance troops were completely annihilated, and Tarantin himself died in battle on the spot. Eighteen wounds were found on his body. Marshal Paskovich speculated that Tarantin knew he had made a grave mistake and chose death in battle to avoid the military court's judgment. Tarantin's death dealt a huge blow to Marshal Paskovich. The marshal was originally against marching forward and besieging the fortress of Silistra. Now, with the hasty attack failed, the noble Tarantin dead, and the siege ineffective, he furiously rebuked his subordinates. This caused resentment among the Russian soldiers at the grassroots level. Not long after, while the marshal was having dinner, a soldier actually threw a grenade at him. Fortunately, the throw was inaccurate, and after the explosion, the marshal narrowly escaped death, but was terribly shaken. He told his aides that he was seriously injured and had to leave immediately. So, he hurriedly left the front line in a carriage without looking back. Once Paskovich left, command of the front line was handed over to the engineering expert Hilda. However, during an inspection of the trenches, Hilda was severely injured by a Turkish bomb and died shortly after. At the same time, Paskovich returned to St. Petersburg to see the Tsar and requested a withdrawal. The Tsar finally agreed. Thus, the Russian forces besieging the fortress of Silistra retreated, not only across the Danube but also out of the entire Balkan Peninsula. By July 28, the Russian army had completely withdrawn from Malakov and Moldavia ending Russia's only offensive stance in the entire war. By this time, it was clear to any discerning observer that continuing the fight would only lead to an even more painful defeat for Russia. In August, the Austrian Empire proposed four points for ending the war to Turkey, Russia, Britain, and France and invited them to peace talks in Vienna. Firstly, the Danube region in the Balkans would remain under Turkish control. The great powers would jointly guarantee Turkey's independence and territorial integrity. Russia promised not to invade the Balkans again. Secondly, Russia promised not to act as the spiritual leader of Eastern Orthodox Christians in the Balkans. Thirdly, Jerusalem's jurisdiction should not be monopolized by Eastern Orthodoxy, but should be resolved through negotiations between Russia and Western Catholic countries. Lastly, without Turkey's permission, the Russian fleet could not pass through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits. These peace terms were virtually a death sentence for Russia. For them, territorial and power expansion were lifelines. For centuries, a small Grand Duchy of Moscow expanded to Siberia and Kamchatka, but Russians were still not satisfied. What else could they do in Siberia besides exiling prisoners and growing potatoes? 
What they truly desired was to plunge into the vibrant world of Europe and the Mediterranean. Since the early 18th century with Peter the Great, successive Tsars made various efforts to enter Europe. Isn't that why Tsar Nicholas I went to war with Turkey? Could agreeing to such terms satisfy Russians in a greed for land? Could it honour the territories conquered by their ancestors? Therefore, the Tsar immediately stated that these terms were non-negotiable. The war would continue. By this time, Russia's fantasy of a quick victory had turned into a war of attrition. Tsar Nicholas I hoped to secure an honourable peace in the end. However, regardless of whether Russia was prepared for a long-term war, Britain and France had already made plans. They were relentless in their pursuit to completely destroy Russia's capability to enter the Mediterranean. Britain and France were indeed seasoned powers, they saw the key to this war at a glance. Since Russia was determined to break through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits, their capital was their Black Sea Fleet. Not long ago, this fleet had achieved a great victory in the Battle of Sinop. It can be said that as long as Russia has a fleet in the Black Sea, they always have a trump card to enter the Mediterranean. To thwart Russia's ambitions once and for all, it was necessary to completely annihilate their Black Sea fleet. In theory, it should be no problem for the powerful Royal Navy to destroy Russia's Black Sea fleet. But even if their fleet was destroyed, Russia could probably build a new one in a few years by exploiting serfs. Therefore, simply sinking ships wouldn't solve the problem if they wanted a lasting solution, they had to uproot it completely by destroying Russia's naval base in Sevastopol. In fact, capturing an enemy's naval base is always more effective than sinking their fleet when it comes to maritime dominance. This principle is not unfamiliar to us in history. In the First Sino-Japanese War, the Japanese combined fleet defeated the Beiyang fleet of the Qing dynasty in the Battle of the Yellow Sea. However, Wei Haiwei and Lushanku were still in the hands of the Qing, and the two ironclad ships Tinyuan and Jinyuan could still return to the dock for repairs. Therefore, the Japanese combined fleet quickly formulated the next battle plan, taking advantage of the Qing's lack of response to swiftly capture Lushuan and Wei Haiwei. It was not until Wei Haiwei fell completely that the Qing completely lost their maritime sovereignty and were forced to negotiate peace with Japan. Therefore, to solve the problem of the Russian Black Sea fleet, it was imperative for Sevastopol to be occupied. For Britain and France, sending fleets to harass Russia in Kamchatka and the Arctic, or even sending warships to blockade St. Petersburg in the Baltic Sea, was all a feint. What the Allies really wanted was to take Sevastopol at all costs. In fact, the Anglo-French alliance had already taken action. They first bombarded the Black Sea port city of Odessa with naval gunfire, completely destroying the port and merchant ships, preventing the Russian Black Sea fleet from utilizing this important port. Subsequently, 60,000 British and French troops gathered in Varna on the Black Sea, reinforced by Turkish forces. They originally planned to take the Crimean Peninsula in one fell swoop, but the logistics of the Allied forces were very poor severely hampering military operations. At that time, Britain and France were the strongest military powers in the world, but their past large-scale combat operations were mostly in developed areas of Europe. Deploying so many troops so far from home in the Black Sea was a first for Britain and France. Since it was their first time, it was inevitable that they would have to pay a tuition fee. The deficiencies in British logistics were glaringly apparent, no one knew where post offices or field hospitals were located, and even the whereabouts of their generals were unclear. Under such circumstances, how could the Allied forces fight effectively? Throughout the summer, they stayed in Varna doing nothing. But that didn't mean there were no casualties, the humid summer brought swarms of insects that invaded the camps, leading to an outbreak of plague. In July, an epidemic broke out in the French camp and quickly spread to the British camp. Despite all tents being burned down, the plague remained uncontrolled. The accompanying British military reporters described the plight of the Allied forces in exaggerated terms, which were published in the Times. As a result, readers all over Britain knew that the military operation was not going well, and that a large number of sick and dead British and French soldiers were left exposed in the wilderness for wild dogs to feed on. The British and French commanders were extremely anxious but helpless. They could only wait for the epidemic to pass before considering landing in Crimea to attack Sevastopol. While they waited, the Russian commander in Crimea was ready to laugh at the Anglo-French alliance. This commander was Prince Menshikov, who had previously served as an ambassador to Turkey with an arrogant attitude and botched affairs. 
The prince habitually berated his subordinate due to his status, and over time his subordinate dared not offer him advice. When reports of an epidemic among the Anglo-French forces were published in newspapers, Menshikov took the reporters' exaggerated descriptions as reality, believing that the Anglo-French forces would certainly collapse without a fight. General Korninov, the chief commander of Sevastopol, handed Menshikov a list of citizens who volunteered to fight, but the prince tore up the list without looking at it and scolded General Korninov for making a fuss and creating panic, before sending him away. Menshikov was an incompetent and irritable superior, although Korninov was angry, he could do nothing about it. After all, with the protection of the Tsar, the prince could do no wrong. With no other choice, Korninov could only strengthen Sevastopol's defences with limited resources at hand. Although Menshikov saw the Anglo-French alliance as nothing more than victims tormented by plague, they would eventually come. At the end of summer, the Anglo-French forces boarded ships and set off for Crimea. As they passed by Sevastopol, the thick smoke from steamships covered the sky and scared onlookers half to death. However, the Allied forces did not directly attack Sevastopol but instead landed at a place called Yepatoria on the backside of the Crimean Peninsula. But just as they were about to land, a violent storm suddenly arose on the Black Sea with towering waves. The Allied forces nearly perished without a fight, such weather during combat in ancient times would often be attributed to divine intervention. The officers and soldiers on board had no choice but to kneel down and pray to God. But this was 1854 when scientific spirit had already taken root among all classes in Britain and France. Seeing that the fleet had suffered heavy losses, French military officials urgently contacted Laveria, director of Paris Observatory at that time, hoping he could clarify this storm. Laveria then wrote to meteorologists worldwide to collect meteorological reports from when the storm occurred. After receiving the reply, he filled out the meteorological conditions of different places at the same time on a map and linked the maps of different times for analysis. He discovered that this storm moved from west to east, and two days before reaching the Black Sea, it had already affected the Mediterranean regions of Spain and France. After analyzing, Laveria believed that if there had been meteorological stations in Europe at that time, storm reports could have been telegraphed in time to the British and French fleets, allowing the Anglo-French Allied forces to avoid the attack of this storm. Subsequently, he suggested to the French Academy of Sciences to organize an observation network, to quickly gather observational data in one place for analysis and drawing weather maps. This led to the birth of the world's earliest weather forecast. The weather information we check on our mobile phones and watch on TV nowadays originated from this storm during the Crimean War. Once the storm subsided, the Anglo-French Allied forces hurriedly organized a landing. For several days, the Allied forces continuously transported troops and materials from warships to shore using small boats. During these days, not even a single Russian soldier intervened in the landing of the Allied forces. Meanwhile, in Sevastopol, citizens flocked to flee the city. Prince Menshikov ordered a complete halt to transportation, and anyone who dared to sneak out of the city was captured and brought back for a military trial. With such a reign of terror, Prince Menshikov barely managed to suppress the emotions of the people at the port. At the same time, the unobstructed Anglo-French Allied forces had already taken advantage of the panic in Sevastopol to land. After landing, the Anglo-French Allied forces were warmly welcomed by the local Russian populace. He prompted questions as to why these Russian commoners were not patriotic and why they were willing to defect. The reason is quite simple. The state was unaware of its citizens, and the citizens were unaware of their state. At that time, a very barbaric serfdom system was implemented in rural Russia. Most of those who found in rural areas were actually slaves. In the eyes of Russian nobility, these serfs were nothing more than talking beasts, beating or injuring them was commonplace. Under such a system, how could one expect serfs to be patriotic? To fight guerrilla warfare against invaders for Russia? That would be asking too much. In 1941, when the German army invaded the Soviet Union, the Ukrainian people were oppressed miserably by Stalin. Hearing that the German army was coming, they immediately dressed in their best clothes and went out with bread and salt to welcome them. This is evidenced by photographs. In 1854, Russian serfs also warmly welcomed the British and French troops. The Allied forces had lost a large amount of logistical supplies in the storm and were worried about their next move. Little did they know that food provided by Russian serfs would solve their urgent need. 
Thus, after landing, the Allied forces completely secured their foothold and advanced towards the mouth of the Alma River. This was Sevastopol's last point to the north where a significant force could be assembled. Capturing it would allow the Allied forces to directly charge towards Sevastopol. Therefore, the Russians were bound to resist desperately here. Prince Menshikov was not completely without strategy. He prepared his position at the mouth of the Alma River to meet the enemy. He was unclear about how many troops the Anglo-French Allied forces had or what their weaponry was like. In Prince Menshikov's eyes, even such a powerful enemy as Napoleon had been defeated by Russian forces. Now it was the turn of the Anglo-French Allied forces, which would surely be no different. Menshikov was still intoxicated with Russia's victory over Napoleon in 1812. Under his command, Russian troops began celebrating before even seeing the enemy. Many new recruits were expecting a parade rather than a battle. The prince invited Sevastopol residents to watch how he would command his troops to defeat the Anglo-French Allied forces. With such an attitude, one can imagine what the Russian military positions were like. Soldiers did not have any sense of tension before a major battle, many officers even brought their families along. Some ladies came with children and even laid out picnic mats behind their positions, just waiting for a spectacle. On the left flank of the Russian position was a hill called Telegraph Hill, which was crucially important. The Russian commander defending this place boasted to ladies and children that if the Anglo-French Allied forces dared to attack, they would throw their hats at them. In Russian custom, throwing hats signifies contempt. This clearly showed they did not take the Anglo-French Allied forces seriously. However, what awaited General Karayakov was not an assault by the Allied forces, but a barrage of shells from above. Telegraph Hill was close to the sea, allowing the Anglo-French naval ships to cover it with intense artillery fire. Under heavy bombardment, Russian positions on Telegraph Hill were utterly devastated. At the same time, the Anglo-French Allied forces began advancing towards the Russian front. Amidst confusion, Prince Menshikov ordered Russian cannons to fire, but they were too far away to hit anyone. Instead, it was the cannons from Anglo-French ships that fired relentlessly, devastating Russian artillery positions. After silencing their artillery, Prince Menshikov still did not panic. He ordered his infantry into formation to engage in close combat with the Anglo-French forces. Unexpectedly, Russian rifles could not reach their target while Allied forces had already opened fire on them. The infantry equipment of the two sides was vastly different. The Anglo-French coalition was armed with the mini rifle, which is the prototype of modern rifles, commonly known as the rifled musket. There were significant improvements in both the bullets and gunpowder, and it could be said to be the prototype of modern rifles. This type of rifle had a long range, was accurate, and had a fast rate of fire, whereas the Russian army still used the old-fashioned flintlock muskets from the time of the Napoleonic Wars, which had a short range, were inaccurate, and could not be loaded as quickly as the mini rifles. It didn't take long for the Russian infantry to be defeated and flee in disarray while the losses of the Anglo-French coalition were minimal as they steadily advanced. At this time, if the Russian troops on Malakoff Hill could have held their ground, they could still have caused significant trouble for the Anglo-French forces. However, the Russian commander on the hill, Kiryakov, who had previously boasted that he would throw his hat at the coalition forces, lost his nerve upon seeing them advance. He hastily ordered a retreat, abandoning the crucial high ground without throwing his hat. Once Malakoff Hill was lost, the French artillery bombarded the Russian positions at the mouth of the Alma River from there. By then, the outcome of the battle was essentially decided. The families of Russian officers had hoped to watch their own troops win a decisive victory in a single engagement, but now they were swept up in the retreat, fleeing in all directions. The defeated Russian soldiers retreated back to Sevastopol without needing orders from Menshikov. The fortress city was now surrounded by land by the Anglo-French forces. Among those who fled back to the city was Kiryakov, who had claimed he would throw his hat at the coalition forces. He was brought before a military court for trial. Menshikov's aide-de-Khan pressed him for answers, but Kiryakov had gone completely mad, repeatedly saying that he had killed his own horse. No matter how he was questioned, he repeated only this line. Of course, feigning insanity did not spare Kiryakov from punishment. Regardless, Sevastopol was completely besieged, and it was unrealistic for the Russian troops inside to expect relief from land. Moreover, the Anglo-French forces could storm the port at any moment. To prevent a surprise attack by them, General Kornilov, 
the commander of the Russian city defences and Admiral Nakamov. Commander of the Black Sea Fleet discussed repeatedly and made an agonizing decision to scuttle all of their main battleships at the harbour entrance to block the Anglo-French fleet's path. Nakamov felt as though his heart was being cut out, but there was no other way at that moment. Watching his flagship from the Battle of Sinop sink was heartbreaking, but he could not afford to grieve. The fate of where the Anglo-French forces would go was already decided. The heavy task of defending besieged Sevastopol now fell to him and Kornilov. At that point, if the Anglo-French coalition had charged towards Sevastopol without regard for anything else, they could have possibly taken advantage of the chaos to capture the city. However, at that time, the coalition commanders were unaware that the city's internal defences were weak and morale was unstable. After all, neither Britain nor France had fought a major war for decades, and their commanders at all levels were trained strictly according to textbook content in military academies. Although being overly cautious strategically could prolong the war, battlefield commanders were not concerned with this, they just needed to avoid tactical errors. Thus, the Anglo-French forces advanced towards Sevastopol slowly and cautiously, stopping after each advance. This was because their overall commander, French Marshal saint Arnaud, had been suffering from malaria since summer, and after landing, his health deteriorated further during the journey, he was on his deathbed. To find a secure place for the Marshal to recover from his illness, the coalition chose a small town called Balaclava as their command centre. As soon as headquarters were established there, Marshal St. Arnold passed away. The deputy commander of the coalition forces, British General Raglan, became the supreme commander. Raglan had been a war hero in his youth and had participated in the famous Battle of Waterloo, losing an arm in combat. However, past glories are not mentioned by a true hero. By 1854, this once heroic figure had aged considerably and become conservative and cautious in character. His first act after assuming command was to convene a meeting to discuss how to attack Sevastopol. At this meeting, the newly appointed French military commander strongly opposed an immediate attack on the grounds that enemy intentions were unclear, and an encounter with stiff resistance could lead to heavy losses for their tens of thousands of troops. With such non-cooperation from the French side, Raglan had no choice but to comply. So what to do if not attack? They simply decided to surround and bombard it with artillery. Throughout the end of September, the Anglo-French coalition was busy transporting cannons and ammunition to the outskirts of Sevastopol. They intended to weaken the defenders with continuous bombardment before taking further action. Inside the city of Sevastopol, what concerned Kornilov and Nakamov the most was the possibility of the Anglo-French forces storming in recklessly. The city was not at all prepared for a siege, they needed time to transform it into a fortress, a considerable amount of time. However, the coalition forces inadvertently gave the Russians this time. By late September, when the Russians noticed that the coalition had stopped at Balaclava, Kornilov breathed a sigh of relief. He said to those around him, it seems God has not forsaken Russia. With time on their side, the Russian troops began to dig defensive works desperately. This task was not only undertaken by soldiers, ordinary citizens of the city were also conscripted to dig trenches and build bunkers. Within a few days, Sevastopol transformed from a beautiful seaside city into a heavily fortified fortress. Barricades were also erected in the streets, windows were sealed, leaving only loopholes for shooting. The roads leading out of the city were even more guarded by cannons and bunkers. When the Anglo-French coalition began to bombard the city, the defenders returned fire without hesitation. The Russians even used their artillery to directly destroy a French army ammunition depot which greatly dismayed the British war correspondents. They wrote in the Daily Telegraph, the fortress of Sevastopol is much stronger than we imagined, the calibre of Russian cannons is at least as large as ours, and the strength of their garrison is astonishing. Thus, what could have been a swift raid by the Anglo-French coalition turned into a prolonged siege due to the caution of frontline officers, a siege that lasted longer than anyone had anticipated. In Sevastopol, General Kornilov was the most steadfast resistor, after the coalition began their bombardment, he breathed intense artillery fire daily to inspect positions and encouraged everyone with brief words. He often said, we have nowhere to flee, the enemy is in front and the sea is behind. This echoed the line from the movie, The Battle for Moscow, the Soviet Union is vast, but you have nowhere to retreat, Moscow is behind you. General Kornilov posted reports all over the city, telling everyone to hold their ground until the end. 
The report read, remember not to believe in signals of retreat, only traitors would retreat. If I retreat, kill me. With such words, it would be utterly dishonorable if the military and civilians of Sevastopol did not unite against the enemy. In October, Russian artillery caused huge losses to the Anglo-French coalition and even damaged several of their warships. It must be said that many of Russia's mid-level and junior commanders and soldiers had a strong patriotic fervor and fought well. General Kornilov was an example for them. However, under Russia's aristocratic hierarchy, despite their eagerness to serve their country, the common soldiers had little opportunity to do so. And Kornilov himself was severely wounded by shrapnel from the coalition during an inspection. When his companion General Nakamov arrived at the field hospital, Kornilov was on his last breath. With all his remaining strength, he uttered his last words to Nakamov, good people don't live long. Later, General Kondratenko's fate during the Russo-Japanese war in defending Port Arthur was strikingly similar to that of Kornilov. These military men's fates are an exquisite irony for the Russian army. So, what became of Sevastopol? How did this war end? Please subscribe to my channel, my next video will continue with the grand finale of the Crimean War.